On behalf of Ambassador Azaz Ahmed Chaudhary, Director General Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad, and Dr. Stephen Kodela, Resident Representative, Hans Seidel Foundation, Pakistan, I warmly welcome you all at today's workshop. Uh, dear participants, the ACDC has organized this workshop in collaboration with Hans Seidel Foundation, Pakistan, on a very important subject, that is internet, artificial intelligence, and quantum technologies, implications for security and foreign policy. Ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of 2021, when we look at some of the top emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, 3D printing, drones, robotics, related commercial and military technologies, and quantum computing, all these technologies are acting as an agent of change. They have the potential to transform our future and our national security. However, it's important to note that access to such technologies, their application and realization of their true potential sometimes create complex challenges. For example, the internet has transformed the means of communication in such a way that it is affecting national security and conduct of foreign policy. Now traditional diplomacy has been transformed into digital diplomacy. Moreover, states are ensuring the protection of cyberspace from cyber threats and cyber warfare to safeguard their social, economic, and national security interests. States are even introducing strong data protection laws and regulations. Similarly, artificial intelligence is rapidly growing technology. According to Government Official Intelligence Readiness Index 2019, Artificial intelligence is forecasted to add US dollar 15 trillion to the global economy by 2030. According to the OECD Digital Economic Outlook 2020, by June 2020, over 60 countries had developed national AI strategies or policy on artificial intelligence, and others are following. Similarly, AI, AI is going to change state behavior in major ways. World is already witnessing a growing competition between major powers to dominate each other in the military application of AI. For example, AI is expected to become a more widely used in aids to decision making in command and control structures, platforms as a potential trusted advisor in future. Likewise, quantum technology is not only opening doors to new technologies but it is also enhancing the great power competition for quantum supremacy. Recently, Beijing has claimed quantum supremacy, that it has developed a new quantum computer which can solve mathematical problems in 200 seconds that it would take current supercomputers million of years to solve. Similarly, the quantum outlook and the quantum network around it will revolutionize the way we live and work. So with this premises, uh, premise, I premise the ISCDC and the ISSI in collaboration with Hans Seidel Foundation has organized this online workshop on internet, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies and their security policy implications. Uh, there are many questions uh, which I believe uh, our uh, guest speaker is going to address. And here I also put some questions for him that how interplay of internet, artificial intelligence and quantum technologies are going to impact security and foreign policy. Number two, are emerging technologies going to increase competition or cooperation and how states are going to address complex challenges arising out of the use of these emerging technology, technologies, especially the developing countries like Pakistan. For that purpose, we are honored to have among us, Dr. Daniel Wilson, he is Senior Associate, German Institute for International Security Affairs. Before we formally start our uh, workshop, I have an, an important announcement to make uh, that for an open and frank discussion, we will not record question and our discussion session. Participants can share their questions in the chat section, which would be addressed later during the Q&A discussion session by Dr. Wilson. Uh, now, we, ladies and gentlemen, before we begin our uh, event, 
uh, first of all, uh, I would like to invite Ambassador Zaz Ahmed Chaudhary, Director General, uh, Institute of Strategic Studies for Hind. Welcome remarks. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to introduce him first. Uh, before joining the Institute, Ambassador Zaz Ahmed Chaudhary has served as a member of the Foreign Service of Pakistan for 37 years. He served as a Foreign Secretary of Pakistan for over three years. His last diplomatic assignment was an Ambassador of Pakistan to the United States. He also authored a book titled Pakistan Mirror to Dutch Eyes, published by Sangi Mill Publication. Sir, now I hand over the floor to you for your welcome remarks. Thank you, Kasim. Uh, I want to commend the Arms Control and Disarmament Center of the Institute uh, for putting together this workshop on such an important and and little understood uh, subject of artificial intelligence and quantum technologies. I also want to express gratefulness to Hans Seidel Stiftung, uh, which has been our partner for many, many years. And within the country, in Pakistan, they have been organized, uh, organizing a number of activities on several themes of significance for our country. And in the context of foreign and security policies domain, they interact with us as well. So thank you, Hans Seidel. Let me uh, say that uh, we all are aware how rapidly the world is changing and the, particularly the strategic landscape. Uh, we all know uh, from discussions that uh, focuses all on uh, the change in the United States today, the change of hands uh, of presidency, and people are speculating as to what would be the priorities. And in almost all the write-ups that I read, everybody thinks that his focus, apart from domestic issues, which naturally for every president is very, very important, the US competition with China will probably remain the defining feature for the occupancy uh, of presidency in the first few months and perhaps years, which I understand has big Im time importance for all countries, including Pakistan. But in the process, I do feel that while so much international attention has been soaked up by the strategic landscape, we are not paying enough in attention to what is now being described as fourth industrial revolution. Development of emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, and high-speed internet. The scale is scale of change is stupendous. The speed of change is uh, flabbergasting. And what I do read sometimes is that international regulation of this fast developing area of activity is much slower than the change of pace in the technology section. Uh, when you say quantum computers, quantum networks, qubits, qubits, quantum encryption, quantum sensors, to tell you very honestly, People like me who are not technical get scared as to what is it that we are referring to and, and how can we understand this as laymen, as uh, non-technical people. And then how do we understand the impact of or implications of these technologies, these emerging technologies for the security and foreign policy of different countries, but also of Pakistan. So that's, that's where this session comes in. And I want to congratulate you all for doing that. And we are, uh, are keen to listen to Daniel Folson um, for, uh, uh, for sharing his valuable thoughts with us. We do understand that all these changes 
have a solid gain to offer to us in terms of uh, businesses, data analysis, uh, medical research, and so on and so forth. And we also understand that there will be major disruptions uh, like cyber attacks and uh, disruption of global financial markets, uh, maybe more lethal weapon systems, etc. We do understand that. But what we need to understand is how fast will this whole spectrum of change, what you are kind of calling quantum change, uh, will take place? And how is it that national governments as well as international community, will they adapt to these changes that are happening? First, we need to understand them. What are the changes? What is the time frame? And then we need to understand how will this change impact our lives and are we doing enough at the national level, at the international level, level to deal with uh, uh, emerging technologies, which I am told will uh, impact the global balance of power in the 21st century. So these are some of my initial thoughts and I, I am very, very keen to listen to our keynote speaker, Ms. Dr. Daniel Folson. And once again, thank you, Hans Heidel, for joining ACDC in this very important workshop. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Sir. Uh, before I invite Dr. Stefan Cordella for his remarks, I would like to introduce him first. Uh, since 2019, Dr. Cordella has been working as the resident representative of Hans Heidel Foundation, Pakistan. Earlier from 2017 to 2019, he worked as an assistant to the country director at a journal, German development corporation, GIZ, uh, Pakistan. He holds a PhD in philosophy and a graduate of Yale University. Now I invite Dr. Stefan Cordella, resident representative and Seidel Foundation, Pakistan, for his remarks. Dr. Stefan, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Malik Mustafa and uh, Ambassador Chaudhry for this, um, for this warm welcome. Dear Dr. Felsen, dear Ambassador Khalid Mahmoud, distinguished guests, it's good to be here and to see you all online. Technological developments such as digitization are and will be one of the greatest game changers for the future of humanity, I believe. They are also non-traditional security challenges. The Unseidel Foundation proudly supports the analysis and evaluation of such challenges as one of its new focus areas in Pakistan. The Unseidel Foundation is a German political foundation that has worked in Pakistan since nearly 40 years. We attempt to strengthen democracy, peace and development worldwide. Today's event is being hosted by our long-standing project partner, the Institute of Strategic Studies, Islamabad. ISSI is a government-financed think tank and research organization that aims at generating a better understanding of regional and global issues with regards to international peace and security. HSF Pakistan and ISSI have been partners since 1993. Our guest speaker today is Dr. Daniel Felsen from the German Institute for International and Security Affairs, SWP. Dr. Felsen is an expert in digital policy and cyber development. He's also a research associate of the SWP division, Global Issues. Before joining SWP, Dr. Felsen worked at the Free University of Berlin and he was a visiting scholar at Columbia University, New York University, and at the University of Cambridge. SWP is considered to be one of Europe's most influential research institutes in international relations. It advises political decision makers, such as the German Federal Parliament Bundestag or the German Federal Government on international politics and foreign and security policy. I am very much looking forward to a great discussion with Dr. Felsen, ISSI, and our distinguished guests on internet, artificial intelligence, and quantum technologies and their implications for security and foreign policy. 
And now, without any further delay, let me hand over to Dr. Felsen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you all very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure and actually an honor to be with you here today to discuss these issues that we want to talk about. I would have loved coming to Pakistan to meet with you in person, um, but since that is obviously not possible right now, we'll have to make do with Zoom. But I'm sure we'll have a fruitful discussion nonetheless. Maybe let me briefly start with two more words on, on my institutional background, which I think might also be interesting for you since in a way we come from very similar institutions. Our core function, as Mr. Gudella already said, is to advise the German federal government and also the members of the federal parliament on all issues of foreign and security policy. A few years ago, a colleague of mine initiated a pilot project on the implications of digital digitalization for German foreign policy. And starting with this pilot project, it soon became clear that there's actually quite a lot of demand for this kind of expertise on the intersection of foreign policy and uh, digitalization. As a consequence, we now have two full-time positions covering this subject. My colleague Matthias Schulze focuses on all questions related to cybersecurity, and I work on all the global efforts by states as well as international organizations to shape the future of digital technologies. Also, it's by now evident that digital technologies affect almost all aspects of foreign policy. As a consequence, my colleagues who cover certain countries or regions now also have to take the, the implications of technology into consideration when uh, addressing their specific fields of expertise. For instance, one cannot fully understand Chinese foreign policy or the internal dynamics of the European Union without also taking account the role of digital technologies. And this brings me right to the topic that I want to discuss with you today, the foreign and security implications of digital technologies. I have prepared a few slides. And I'll try to share them with you now. Okay. We can all see them. What I want to do with my presentation today is three things. First, I want to highlight some of the very specific ways in which the three technologies in the title of my presentation, the internet, artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence and quantum technology affect foreign and security policy. Second, I wanna take a step back and present two different strategic perspectives on these digital technologies. And to conclude then, I want to end my presentation by thinking about strategic options available and chosen by different states. So let me start right away with the applications of digital technologies. The internet. Connecting ever more people and devices, we're not talking about the internet of things, through a digital network offers huge benefits from economic opportunities to new forms of societal interaction and to cultural exchange. Yet, as you all know, this high level and increasing level of interconnection also bears risks. For years now, state and non-state actors have infiltrated network computer systems to collect or manipulate data. The purposes range from political espionage to theft of intellectual property or somewhat more simple ransomware attacks for financial goals. These cyber attacks now affect almost all aspects of the net network. Many, many attacks, in fact, are non-technical and aim to manipulate end users, people like us, through various forms of what's called social engineering and more or less sophisticated phishing attempts, which we all have been having to deal with. Every day, moreover, we learn about new vulnerabilities in end-user software, be it specific programs, apps, or the operating systems themselves. Sometimes, even the basic technical infrastructure of the internet is weaponized. For instance, through manipulations of the basic protocol for routing, for routing data through the internet, the border gateway protocol, 
or by manipulating the Internet's global addressing system, the domain name system operated by the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN. The recent SolarWinds hack, or the, the hack that only recently um, became public, is yet another variant in which the complexity of supply, change, supply chains was used as a means to gain access to a huge number of systems. Importantly, these new threats uh, do not only affect uh, states, governments, uh, or corporations, but also can pose a threat to the security of individuals. As recognized by the UN General Assembly, human rights are to be respected online as in the same way as they are to be respected offline. In addition to these security issues, the internet now also affects foreign policy more broadly. For one thing, as was already said in the introduction, foreign policy today often takes place on the internet. We have live coverage of events anywhere in the world. And indeed, many actors of foreign policy, from elected governments to various non-state actors, now try to use a new public sphere of the internet to advance their goals. Many governments, including the German government, NATO, the European Union, have now formed units for what they call strategic communication to be able to bring their perspectives to the table. More problematic, we see an increase in strategic disinformation, sometimes though not always combined with new forms of computational propaganda. So that's also a first uh, connection to the issue of AI such as the spread of certain information by automated scripts. Moreover, given the huge and further growing importance of the internet, we now witness intense political debates about the global future of the internet. The global internet infrastructure, and I already mentioned the, like, for instance, the basic protocols, but I'm also thinking here of things like uh, submarine cables and other parts of the physical infrastructure. So this global internet infrastructure is maintained through the voluntary cooperation of states as well as the many private entities that operate most of the infrastructure and continue to develop it. Having such a global network for communication is in principle in everyone's interest. But what exactly this network should look like in the future is increasingly contested. Broadly speaking, we see a confrontation between two visions of the internet. The, in a way, traditional liberal model of a decentralized system with, with a strong role for private actors. And on the other hand, a more centralized way of organizing the internet, essentially returning to the traditional model of Westphalian sovereign statehood. This debate or even struggle over the future of the internet today takes place in different fora from technical standards organizations, such as the Internet Engineering Task Force, IETF, all the way to the United Nations. Indeed, in recent years, the UN Secretary General has attempted to raise the profile of the UN. Only a few months ago, he published a roadmap for digital cooperation. In fact, and maybe you can come back to that in the discussion, I understand that at some point in 2014, 2015, Pakistan was a member of the UN Group of Governmental Experts on Developments in the Field of Information and Telecommunication in the Context of International Security. That's a long title. And Pakistan is now also involved in the current open-ended working group process within the United Nations. Maybe if, if you work on these issues, we can come back to that in the discussion. So let me now turn to artificial intelligence. Um, to begin with, <laughs> I don't want to get into a huge discussion here, but let me briefly clarify what I understand AI to be, artificial intelligence to be. I see it as a new set of methods to analyze huge amounts of data. Machine learning algorithms, machine learning is more like the technical term for artificial intelligence. Machine learning algorithms are able to process data at a quantity and speed not possible for humans. Unlike traditional statistics, these algorithms 
are also able to adapt and improve themselves based on empirical input. And in this rather limited sense, they are learning machines. The most prominent examples today for the use of uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning are speech or image recognition. We are all to some extent familiar with that by now. So what are the security and foreign policy implications of AI? It's already been mentioned uh, as part of the introduction. Uh, a number of states supported by a number of companies are now working on the military use of AI technology. So what we're talking about here is uh, often described as lethal autonomous weapons systems. So the idea is to use machine learning algorithms uh, to automate certain aspects of warfare. Um, and the question then is to what extent that's possible, feasible, brings an advantage. Um, and also whether or not there should be limits on the use of AI for warfare. Um, again, we have a UN group of governmental experts trying to find some kind of common ground globally on the use of AI uh, in this context. But my impression is that so far these global efforts lead nowhere. AI also provides new ways to conduct or prevent cyber attacks. Uh, if you want to, we can go into this in more detail in the Q&A part. Basically, the idea is that you can use these uh, machine learning algorithms to monitor networks in a different way. So that's, that's a way to prevent, um, to prevent uh, cyber attacks. But you can also use machine learning algorithms to build new tools to attack systems. And yet another vector is that these new AI systems are also vulnerable, vulnerable in new ways that we don't yet fully understand. When it comes to foreign policy more broadly, and that also was briefly alluded to in the introduction, we today see a fierce international competition over leadership in AI. It's, it's almost like a new arms race. Every, com every state now wants to be the world leader in AI, um, although sometimes that becomes almost ironic. Um, the fear is that there will be a new situation of, of winner takes all. So fear is that at some point, some states and some companies will position themselves as the leaders and then the rest will have no chance to catch up. At the same time, we have very different visions of what AI should be. And here I don't mean technical visions, but more political visions. Um, one crucial point is what kind of data can or should be fed into AI systems. In principle, as I said, AI is a technology that can be used to analyze huge amounts of data. And so it's very tempting to just feed this, uh, these systems with, with whatever kind of data you can find. Um, the challenge then is to balance that with other uh, goals like data protection. Basically, at the moment, you have two, maybe three approaches to this question. Uh, one is the US lab model, which very strongly emphasizes the role of uh, private companies in the development of AI. Then you have the Chinese model, um, where the state heavily tries to interfere or to, to at least orchestrate. Um, the development of AI. Interestingly, in Europe, China is often seen as, as an example of how to do AI. At the same time, many people are wary of like the very loose understanding of data protection in China. The EU for itself is not yet sure, I'd say, which way to go. Um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of talk about a European approach to AI. Um, one of the other buzzwords is human-centric AI. So the European Union wants a human-centric approach to AI. But so far, the European Union has real problems, I'd say, in explaining or in operationalizing what this kind of European approach to AI might actually look like. I think one of you brought it up in, in the introductory part too. What kind of global cooperation can we expect uh, on these issues? There have been many calls for, for regulating AI on a global level. Um, 
Honestly, however, my impression is that these efforts will lead nowhere. As I already briefly mentioned, there is this process within the European, uh, within the United Nations, on lethal autonomous weapons systems and the question whether to regulate the use of these. Um, that's leading nowhere, and there are a few other initiatives trying to address the uh, like political public policy implications of AI on a global level. But my impression is that all this is overshadowed by this, as I already mentioned, this fierce international competition. We are right now in a situation where every state and lots of companies just try to be, to be the winners in this competition and they don't want to be limited by any kind of global regulation. So unfortunately, I don't see a lot of uh, potential for global cooperation here. So let me then turn to quantum technology and that's gonna be a little bit shorter. Um, again, we can talk probably endlessly about what quantum technology is. Um, I personally still find it difficult to understand uh, and explain what exactly quantum technology is and more spe specifically what quantum computing is. Uh, I keep reading uh, about it and, and watching talks and every time I, I think I understood what it is, <laughs> it again eludes me. But hugely simplified, I think we can and that's, that's true. I think we can think of quantum computing as an entirely new type of computing. Uh, so the way we, uh, the kind of computers we have today are basically based on two binary states, on, off, yes, no, one, zero. That's, that's, a, that's a binary logic of computers um, and every computer uses that, that kind of logic today. Quantum computing on the contrary makes use of the specific features of quantums. And now don't ask me what exactly quantums are. I'm not a physicist, but what, what the relevant point here is that when these quantums are manipulated, they can be in a state that goes beyond the binary distinction of one and zero. And that allows for a very different kind of computing. And this in turn, from what I understand, has the potential of creating computers that are way more powerful um, than even the most advanced supercomputers we have today. My impression here is that there's also a lot of um, hype about quantum computing right now. Um, we see companies claiming quantum supremacy um, from time to time, um, we see huge investments by a few states, uh, national states in quantum strategies. Uh, the German government also is coming up with a quantum technology strategy. The, I think the situation we're in right now is that this technology has a huge potential to fundamentally change the way computers work. But right now we're still maybe 10, 15 years, 20 years away from actual quantum computers. And we may, it, it may even take longer than that. So it may be that none of us will, exp will actually work with these kind of computers. But on the other hand, if they come to, um, if, if, this, if all the existing technological challenges are solved and we get these quantum computers, the change would be huge. So it makes sense, I think, to strategically think through what this means. And one of the most prominent issues that's always coming up in discussions about quantum technology is in terms of security policy, the fundamental risk to all of today's encryption mechanisms. Um, we all rely on encrypting uh, large parts of the digital communication we engage in. Even the Zoom meeting to some extent is encrypted and thus protected uh, from being um, surveyed by everyone. Um, all governments have their digital data uh, protected by encryption. And the fear is that if we get these computers that are so much more, so exponentially more powerful than all the computers we have today, they will easily be able to break all the, all the encryption mechanisms we use today. Um, and as I said, maybe, we, maybe it will take decades until we get to this point. Maybe, however, we get quantum computers earlier. And so, I think we need to prepare for a world in which the mechanisms for encryption we have today no longer work. And actually there are, there are states that work on what they then call quantum proof uh, encryption mechanisms. 
Okay, I want to turn now to um, the strategic perspectives. So I, I, I try to, it's a, it's a huge topic, the internet, artificial intelligence and quantum computing. And so I hope I was able to at least briefly allude to some of the most pressing uh, foreign security policy challenges. Um, and now I want to take a step back and talk about the, the larger strategic perspectives on these uh, technologies. And in thinking about this, I was, uh, I was heavily inspired by this book by Emery Slaughter, The Chessboard and the Web, Strategies of Connection in Networked World. Basically, what she does here is she, she suggests that we should always simultaneously see international affairs from two perspectives. The first is the chessboard of traditional geopolitics, where states interact along well-established lines of foreign policy. And the second is a world of formal and informal networks, where state and non-state actors shape international affairs through loose networks and new, often non-binding governance mechanisms. So her argument is that, that, we, that these two perspectives apply to basically all areas of uh, foreign policy, but I find it particularly relevant to apply this, this dual view of international affairs to the intersection of technology and internal and foreign policy. These two perspectives do not um, exclude each other, but they do point our attention in different directions. And just very briefly, I've tried to um, sum up here some of the main points. So the chessboard view, the traditional geopolitical view, emphasizes traditional power resources, military resources, financial resources. Um, it focuses on physical proximity, distance, territorial borders, former rules and procedures, and it places great emphasis on state actors. The network view of international affairs, what Slaughter calls the web, on the contrary, emphasizes the power of central nodes in networks. It's a different kind of power. It does not mean that traditional power resources are no longer relevant, but we get a different kind of power, or we get into a different kind of power position when we occupy central nodes in networks. Whereas a tr traditional view emphasizes physical relations of proximity and distance, the web view emphasizes centrality in social technical networks, and the diversity and degree of connectivity. Again, it's about where you situate yourself within a network and that network need not correspond to our physical landscape. You have a corresponding emphasis on informal arrangements, voluntary coordination, and this view also grants non-state actors a bigger role, for example, private companies and civil society. Maybe not in a normative sense, but at least analy analytically, it means that we need to take seriously what all these actors contribute to international affairs. In terms of policy, this network-centered view of international affairs implies distinct objectives and methods for states to act in international affairs. So what states can do, I'd say, uh, basically they have three options. First, secure a central position in techno-political networks. Uh, that means occupy positions at critical junctures, choke points of networks and shape the sub-networks internal logic to fit with their interests. I'll, I'll be more specific, more explicit later. But that's like one, one approach. If you, if you think in terms of networks, one approach would be to secure a central position in these networks. More or less the opposite of that is to isolate your own part of the network from the larger network by cutting all almost all connections to the larger network. So that way you limit your connections to the larger network. And then a third option is to diversify your network relations, uh, not to depend on certain actors too much, not to depend on certain choke points too much, and thus to avoid dependence on central nodes and maintain a certain degree of strategic autonomy in shaping your network relations. To clarify these 
three different approaches to networked digital foreign policy. I now want to um, talk about a few examples. And I should be able to finish that within the time um, set for my presentation. So again, the first um, position, or the first approach, secure a central position in technopolitical networks. The US, I'd say, can be understood as a state that follows this kind of approach, though they don't usually use the term networked foreign policy. The goal for the US, at least since the end of the Second World War, uh, has been to achieve technological dominance, sometimes it's also called supremacy, as a main pillar of national security. Technological dominance is considered, and that has been going, has been considered since, as I said, at the beginning of the Cold War, is considered as one of the main foundations of the power of the United States, economically, militarily, and more broadly, politically. It's also seen as a major requisite for projecting power internationally. Again, coming back to this network logic, this means that by being the dominant actor in technologies, the one that develops major technologies, provides major technologies, the US wants to secure or aims to secure a central role in relevant technological networks. One example where you can see that is the internet. Um, they had early investments in the development of the underlying technology going back to the 70s and 80s. Um, then early, very deliberate efforts to support the domestic internet industry by creating new market opportunities and reducing regulatory obligations, and also continuous efforts to shape the global development of the internet in a way that fits or that serves uh, US interests. And that we that, that kind of reinforces the centrality of US actors in this network. AI is a more recent example where you can see this kind of uh, approach um, being used. Um, what I brought with me here is um, executive order. It's almost two years old now, but still I think it's a great example. It's an executive order on maintaining American leadership in artificial intelligence and uh, what's highlighted here, I'm not sure if you can read it, so I'll read it uh, out for you, is continued American leadership in AI is of paramount importance to maintaining the economic and national security of the United States and to shaping the global evolution of AI in a manner consistent with our nation's values, policies, and priorities. Um, again, what I find helpful is to, to see this uh, as reaching for a position in which you can't do AI, which you can't use AI without depending on US technology. And therefore, thereby also reinforcing the central role of the US. China now today has a very similar understanding, I'd say, of the strategic role of digital technologies. The ambition clearly expressed by the Made in China 2025 strategy is to achieve global leadership in key technologies. And that's uh, basically the same approach as the US uh, government's approach. In this context, the digital, the digital Silk Road, i.e. digital infrastructure projects, is an important instrument for expanding China's global influence. And it's also a great example of network policy. The Chinese government deliberately sets out to create a new network, the Belt and Road Initiative, within which the Chinese government and Chinese uh, companies occupy central positions. And once you, once you brought yourself into such a position of centrality, that again gives you new ways of exercising power. And uh, one, one great example, very technical example, and still a great example is um, analyzed in, in depth by my friend and colleague, um, Tim Rulik, in the paper I um, put on the slide here. Um, as part of these, these infrastructure projects, um, China also always makes sure to, to, um, to export its technical standards. 
and with these technical standards also certain political standards. And by creating this new network that depends on Chinese technology and Chinese, te Chinese uh, technical standards, it creates past dependencies. And again, to emphasize that point, it creates a situation in which the whole technopolitical network depends on China, depends on Chinese standards in this instance. And this provides China, or will, that's at least the goal, will provide China with new ways of exercising power. They don't need military anymore in the future, but they can use these standards in the same way the US did with the internet to project power internationally. So what is Europe doing? The way I perceive it, the open and intensifying confrontation between the US and China, especially in the field of technology, has initiated a return to geopolitics in Europe. Germany, for a few years now, we've had a discourse about digital sovereignty. Um, I see that as a response to what's happening uh, on the global level. On the level of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, the new head of the commission, clearly stated her ambition to lead a geopolitical commission. That's an ambition that was, for the most part, received positively in EU member states. So if you again think of these two different uh, strategic approaches, that means that for now, it seems the European Union places all its bets on the traditional chessboard game. Um, not really talking about network foreign policy, but returning to traditional uh, to the traditional chessboard game. The problem, however, is that it's not really clear what it could and should and should mean for Europe to pursue its own geopolitical agenda. It's not clear what exactly the goal should be, since uh, at the moment, at least, Europe does not have any ambitions that go beyond its own. Um, its own territory. So in that sense, we do not have any geopolitical goals there. Um, and it's, it's basically a question if Europe should aim to establish its own sphere of influence going beyond Europe. More importantly, however, it's highly questionable whether Europe has a technical, technological and political capacity to engage in an open geopolitical confrontation with the US and China. So we may say that we want to be like more geopolitically ambitious, but it's not clear if we can actually compete in that game. Finally, uh, I want to turn to the two other approaches, um, isolation and diversification. North Korea, I think, is an extreme example of a state that deliberately avoids connecting its society with a larger internet. It's hard to measure the exact causal effects of this uh, policy, but it certainly deprives Koreans of many of the benefits the internet has to offer and keeps the society as a whole trapped in a low level of economic development. What's interesting, however, is that at the same time, the North Korean government does selectively make use of the internet's network features. Uh, North Korea has built up serious cyber capacities um, operationally mostly outside the country to engage in cyber attacks. And from what we know today, the main goal is to, to raise money, raise revenues for the North Korean government. So the interesting combination here is that we have a government that wants to isolate its society from the larger network, but selectively wants to make use of, uh, in a way I'd say a very modern networked approach to, um, to the internet. An interesting example for diversification of network relations and an active embrace of these network relations, I think is Estonia. It's a very small country, uh, 1.3 million citizens. Uh, that's, that's not a lot. But it's a country that decided very early on to fundamentally modernize its public bureaucracies. So you have uh, electronic IDs now, you have an e-residency program. One thing I find quite fascinating is that you have a digital back of 
backup of the entire um, state operations. I think it's in Monaco. Um, so they basically backed up all their all their government data in a different place um, to prepare themselves for the unlikely but always looming um, prospect of a Russian invasion. With regards to its own government operations, Estonia therefore now truly exhibits um, what in Germany we keep discussing, namely digital sovereignty. As a fully digital state, moreover, Estonia has become attractive far beyond its territorial borders. Uh, so it, especially through its uh, e-residency program, it now attracts many companies um, that would probably not have taken notice of, of the country otherwise. So what I find interesting here is that we have a very small state with limited resources that nonetheless strategically decided to situate itself actively in this new network uh, of, a, of, a, of the internet and to make use of it. That's um, the, the web side of, these, of this e-residency program. It's also interesting because it in a way goes beyond the, like the traditional com commitment of states to territory. Um, I mean, the Estonian state still is fond of its territory, but it does not only perceive itself of itself in, in territorial terms, but thinks of itself as a, yeah, as a digital nation um, that's not limited to the small Estonian territory. So in sum, my first conclusion is that when it comes to new technologies, the challenge for governments is to simultaneously act on two levels. One is the chessboard um, of traditional geopolitics, and here it's about the ability and readiness to engage in limited geopolitical confrontations with the US and China as the two major uh, leading uh, states in this field. At the same time, however, I hope to have shown that there is potential in not only looking at this through a traditional um, perspective, but also taking seriously the network nature of these technologies and the new potentials for acting in terms of foreign policy that these network technologies provide. So that's the idea of strategically, strategically making use of these networked features. And as I briefly tried to explain, there are different ways to do that. Um, it's, it's quite a spectrum from North Korea to Estonia. My second conclusion is not really a conclusion. Uh, I've talked a lot now, and I've talked mostly from a European, probably also very German perspective. Um, I don't want to purport to be an expert on Pakistan's foreign and security policy, but I'd be very curious to hear from you if what I talked about today resonates with the kind of discussions you are having uh, in terms of strategic uh, reasoning when it comes to Pakistan's foreign policy. So example, what, for example, what is the state of the debate about the foreign and security implications of digital technologies in Pakistan? What is Pakistan's approach to the global debates? Um, for instance, the UN Jack General Secretary's Roadmap for digital, digital Cooperation. And what is your thinking on how Pakistan can respond to the growing tech rivalry between China and the US? Um, that's been a huge debate in Europe, as I, as I mentioned, and I'd be very interested to hear what your thoughts on this are. Thank you so much for your attention, and now I very much look forward to the Q&A part. Uh, because uh, in the past also, many disruptive technologies, dual use technologies have emerged and the international community has found ways and means of cooperating and ensuring that those technologies uh, do not cause harm, but rather are harnessed for uh, uh, useful purposes. So I think through wise management, and internationally agreed regulatory mechanisms, we can uh, assure uh, that these uh, technologies uh, are uh, put to good use uh, as uh, uh, 
Dr. Walson said that there are two approaches, chessboard versus networking. I think uh, history tells us that networking would be a better choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman, Board of Governors Institute of Studies, Studies Islamabad. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to an end of this event, and I believe it was a very useful and wonderful event. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the presentation made by Dr. Daniel Wilson, and we hope that we will engage him in future endeavors like these. And uh, once again, I thank you, Dr. Daniel Wilson. Uh, for taking out time for this uh, wonderful talk. I thank you all the participants for their valuable time and their comments and their questions. Uh, and again, I thank you, Dr. Stephen Codella and his team uh, for collaborating this uh, wonderful event and helping us enlighten about the uh, these future emerging technologies. Uh, I would also like to thank the ACDC team for making this uh, event uh, a successful event. And I also thank the technical team of Institute of Strategic Studies for providing us all the Zoom-related facilities and all these uh, uh, technical equipment and facilities. Uh, I also want to make an point, uh, announcement that uh, recording and report and for press release, uh, you can visit our website. And uh, once again, I thank you all. Uh, for joining us today and uh, with this uh, I say goodbye to you, to you all uh, and goodbye to Dr. Walson and Dr. Stephen Catella and all the participants. <laughs>